Welcome on out to the Potter's House, everybody. Come on, let's stand in the Lord's praise this morning. Hallelujah.
Church, which is my uh, mother church, uh, the founder of our fellowship, uh, Pastor Mitchell passed away last week, uh, and uh, and so uh, Pastor Greg Mitchell is, uh, of course, has been in place for some time, uh, but he's always kind of had his father, maybe his father's advice, maybe his father to fall back on, but Pastor Mitchell got very sick uh, recently and was not able and so, uh, amen. So we're praying for Pastor Greg, praying for strength, wisdom, uh, ability, amen, to pastor not only the church uh, in Arizona, but also uh, the worldwide fellowship, uh, praise God, that is ours uh, throughout the world. And so we're believing God for that, praying for our Ohio Valley churches as well throughout the area, believing God uh, for you, praying for those that are sick in body, praying for Missy. Amen. Praying for Tammy, believing God for others, sick in body, struggling. Uh, amen. Praying for Ty, believing God for him. Uh, praying for God to move by his uh, spirit in his life, believing God for others, maybe that are missing. Uh, those of you that are visiting, uh, amen. First time visitors, thank you very much for coming. Uh, may God bless you richly this morning. Uh, let this be a, a tipping point in your life, and we're praying. I mean, that's how pastors think, isn't it? That every service could be a tipping point. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. And some people come in, oh, they're just on their phone the whole time. But anyway, so we are believing God for big things. Big things. A little church doing big things. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Brother Dustin Darty will open us up in a word of prayer. Before he does that, lift up your hands. Towards heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. Praying for Tyler. Good to have him back. Hallelujah. Been a long time. Praise God. We're believing God for him. Every element of his life will be all God. Amen. We're praying for that right now. Amen. Brother Dusty will uh, prepare. Let's lift up our hands towards heaven. And let's call upon the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. We thank you, Lord. You are worthy, God, in this place. We need you, Jesus. To meet us at our point of need, Lord. We Heavenly Father, we just thank you for bringing us here this morning, Lord God. We just ask you, Lord, you would have your hand on all these prayer requests, Lord God. You meet all these needs this morning, Father. 
And I pray that you would bless the word that's going to be brought forth through our pastor this morning, Lord God. Let us touch our hearts and our minds. Let us leave this place better than we came into it this morning, Lord God. And let us just catch a fire of revival in this place this morning, Lord God. Let us just be ready, Lord God, for, for these last days, Lord God. Let us just continue to harvest souls, Lord God, for your kingdom in, in these days, Lord God. And just, just let us run full tilt, Lord God, to the end of the race, Lord God. We just give you glory and honor in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Take a moment, turn to somebody near you, welcome them into the house of God, greet somebody in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Take a moment and wait. I know it's 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 hard. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Welcome. It's great to have you here this morning. We do have a couple of quick announcements. Uh, amen. This Wednesday. Say this Wednesday. This Wednesday. Turn to somebody next to you and say this Wednesday. This Wednesday. And now say this, uh, uh, Kevin and Lindsay, to your kids. There will be no basketball, no baseball, no football. Okay, you don't have to. But anyway. So uh, we are starting, it's, it's an awkward time, but it's the only time we could get him. Uh, and he's, he's very popular throughout the fellowship. Uh, amen, Pastor uh, Evangelist Roderick Gonzalez will be doing a quick Wednesday, Thursday, Friday night uh, revival for us. And it's starting Wednesday night, yeah. Thursday night, and Friday night. Uh, amen, no matter what just popped into your head, you will be here. Uh, praise the Lord. Amen. So do the best you can. Seriously, we're going to have a great time. We're uh, believing God. Uh, that's the only times I could I could get him, Thursday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then Saturday morning, he'll do the men's discipleship here for the area wide. Uh, there will be churches from Pittsburgh, uh, Cincinnati, uh, Columbus, Dayton, uh, and perhaps even Huntington, West Virginia. So if, if they come. Uh, so there's going to be just a couple of, there's going to be some men, uh, you know, 30, 40 men here. And uh, he's going to preach a men's discipleship after we feed them an amazing breakfast. Amen. So that'll be Saturday morning at 10 for breakfast, 11 for preaching the word of God. And so that is men's discipleship this coming Saturday. Uh, prior to that, uh, and, uh, is, uh, and they, these dates were supposed to be later, but we had to change them for flight reasons. They canceled. You know how the flights are. They're canceling things left and right. So they canceled his flight. And the only one he could get was me. For uh, the men's discipleship instead of after. So we're doing Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I'm hoping for the best. Our nighttime services are usually very low in attendance, and we need you to step up. We need you to be a part of it. We need you to come and help us. And I want to tell you something. This guy, you won't want to miss uh, the preaching. He spent, uh, uh, I think, six years in China. But other than that, uh, uh, he is a tremendous Tremendous preacher, tremendous man of God. And so, uh, amen, Roderick Gonzalez. And he'll be here Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So, if you can also be here, that would be a blessing. Okay, so we have that. We have men's discipleship. Those are all the announcements we have right now. And then, by the way, we don't have anything else revival-wise scheduled. What uh, what's what that? Is the oh, 7 o'clock each night. Seven. Yeah, 7 o'clock each night. Just like a Wednesday night service time. So it'll be 7 o'clock each night. And we don't have anything else scheduled until the end of the year, all the way through the year. And, and probably around the bend until maybe February. Yes. Um, we will be resuming our financial peace university classes October 22nd. It's a Thursday. So we will be switching to Thursday night at 7 o'clock. Okay. Um, Financial Peace University, we were in the middle of it, paying off our bills, uh, becoming rich in our own sense, and then <laughs> COVID came. Not only did we have to cancel the class, but we also lost our jobs, many people, uh, all kinds of things happened. But I think our church has made it through pretty well, actually. Uh, we've been blessed. Uh, I, I think everybody, am I right, is back to work? 
That was out of work. Everybody. Some are back to work with better jobs. More money than they were making before. Only God can do that. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So, praise God. So that's all the announcements we have. Let's give the Lord praise. Our usher would come. We want to take an offering. Let's give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, somebody. Amen. We have seen God do miracle after miracle after miracle in our lives. Um, my wife and I, our family. And I can say, and I've taught my children, and Aaron and Ryan could both testify. In fact, you couldn't get Ryan to testify because he hates to do so, but as far as speaking in public, but uh, amen. Uh, he just got a better job than he had before, more money. Uh, and uh, uh, some other things have happened that have been miracles in his life, and he's been a faithful, amazing tither uh, all along. A, a tithe is simply this, a tenth is the Lord's. A tenth of everything that comes in to your life is the Lord's, and offerings besides. So that's all that a tithe is. And it is just, it is just saying to the Lord, I believe that you are my sustenance, that you are my rewarder for diligence. You are my, uh, you are my God, uh, Amen, and uh, pro my provider, and uh, the reason that I move and live and and do the things that I do. And so, therefore, you're entitled to give, for me to give back what belongs to you. And on top of that. I'll give you offerings because I love you and I care for you. And the Lord will take a lifetime. He will remove you out of the world's economy by giving a tenth. He'll remove you out of the world's economy and you'll be in God's economy. That does not go with the ebb and flow of the stock market. It does not go with, a, with, with who is president of the United States. God's economy takes care of you no matter what else is happening. How many have all been taken care of by God throughout the entire COVID? That's right, you look at that. It has been amazing. We've been untouched financially as a church by COVID. Untouched. It's just amazing to hear that. But it's we've had marriages completely healed. We've seen all manner of things happen in our church over the last year. But money was a, a, a bit of an issue until God said, you know what, I've had enough of that. And he started getting a hold of people. And he started speaking to people. And now God's helped us. And so it's just amazing to see what God can do. Let's give as the Lord will lead us to give. Let's be honest and faithful. And let's continue to do work for God. Uh, amen. You can go live stream uh, to phohio.com. And there you can find our online giving uh, button. You can click that. Uh, you can do that from your seats as well. And again, we'll carry cash. They don't have a checkbook. Uh, amen. So they like to give online. You can do that very much. Otherwise, we we'll give as the Lord will lead us to give. So let's believe God in this place. Amen, Brother Alex, would you bless you all? Thank you, Father God. Thank you for this opportunity to serve your kingdom this morning, God, Father God. Lord, bless our and God, multiply this mind. Bless the gift, the Lord, the giver. In the precious and holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord.
platform. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to have you here. Uh, hallelujah. Helping us out. Philippians chapter 3, if you have your Bibles. Philippians chapter 3, amen. Remember to dream is the title. Praise God. I, uh, you know, sometimes God speaks to me about what to preach and I I pick it up this time. God gave me seven reminders through different, uh, different. I mean, I, I got a, uh, a a daily devotional uh, that reminded me. I got a, a text uh, of somebody else's devotional using the same scripture. Uh, I, just all manner of things just begin to come at me and what to preach this morning. And uh, so I'm just excited about this. Philippians chapter 3, very familiar portion of scripture. I recently read a blog that contained an excerpt from a book by Pastor Mark Batterson, whom I often quote. I love, he's got some great quips, some great quotes, uh, got some great wisdom. He's always got insight, and in like fashion, he makes an insightful observation about aging. How many know that probably at my point of my life, I might think once in a while about aging? Not very often. I like to stay youthful. Amen. My brain thinks I'm 19. My body says otherwise. And so I've, uh, he's got some great insight about aging that totally resonated with me. And I quote, he says, neuroimaging has shown that as we age, the center of cognitive gravity tends to shift from the imaginative right brain to the logical left brain. And this ne neurological tendency presents a grave danger. At some point, most of us will stop living out of imagination or dreaming or, 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 or pressing in or, or, or de desiring uh, or, or thinking about what awesome things could happen, the miracle, uh, the, the transcendent, uh, the, the imaginative side. At some point, most of us stop living out of the imagination and we start living off of memory, out of memory. Instead of creating the future, we start repeating the past. Instead of living by faith, we live by logic. We live by, uh, by circumstances and experience from our past. We start allowing our past to dictate where we are in life and in the future. And so, instead of going after our dreams, we stop circling Jericho and start believing perhaps because of that that Jericho is not attainable. As I get older, personally, I'm beginning to see how tempting it can be to live by logic. You know, you've seen, I don't know if you've seen the commercials where they say, you know, uh, there comes a point in time where you're going to act like your father did. Right? You'll be sitting at the dinner table. When we were 19, we would all be talking at once. You remember those days? And, and everybody's talking about all kinds of, they're excited about everything. Now we're talking about the price of car insurance and how ridiculous it is it's raised. We're talking about the evil of politics and what's going on in our world and as I get older, I'm beginning to see how tempting it is. It can be to live by logic. It's, it's deeply ingrained. I believe through cultural conditioning, generational strongholds, and plain old lazy thinking. How many can say that? How many has been a lazy thinker? Amen. Pastor Adam Stanley once said, when your memories exceed your dreams, your end is near. He said, when you're Come on, are you with me? When your memories exceed your dreams, when your past is more important than what you're dreaming for your future, then your end is near. How true. When people in your life start reminiscing about the good old days. Like the opening theme song from the 70s sitcom, All in the Family. It's time to stop and get some perspective this morning. Have you ever noticed that as some people age, they get more pessimistic. They, they, life 
it, it no longer has any good things for them. They, they're, they're kind of, you know, pessimistic about everything and, and negative and, they, you know, uh, negative Nancy and, and it goes on. And so constantly pointing out what's wrong with the world, why the future looks so dim. How tough it will be for the next generation. Well, while I completely agree that there's more to be concerned about in the world today than in recent decades, I can't help but think about our parents and our grandparents and great-grandparents that said pretty much the same thing as they got old. Yet in some cases, like the depths of the Civil War, the Great Depression, or the start of World War II, imagine a family of Polish Jews at the start of the 1939 Nazi invasion. How much darker could it get than that? And they had every right to never want to repeat the past. Yet despite all of our current problems, church, are you listening to me? We live in the most amazing period in human history. We have comforts and freedoms and opportunities to inject meaning and purpose into our lives regardless of our age, which our ancestors couldn't even imagine. You know, the wealthiest kings and the greatest pharaohs of all time would have traded their kingdoms for a flush toilet. They would have. And you have that. They had to walk everywhere they went. You'd take a golf cart to the bathroom if your house could fit in your hallway. <laughs> That's the generation we live in. Amen. And so, the Apostle Paul in Philippians gives us a warning that mimics what Mark Batterson was writing about living in the past without glorifying memories and the science of aging and, and neuroimaging. So I'm going to talk a little bit about living in the past. I've dealt with people still living a certain way because of something that happened 30 years ago. Or they're so wrecked with guilt from past sins and past issues and past uh, uh, mistakes or, or bad decisions that they can't seem to do anything today. They can't seem to get through a day. Amen. They're so wrapped with guilt they can't seem to know what tomorrow will bring. Or they don't even want to think about what tomorrow will bring. Or they'll think they don't deserve anything tomorrow because yesterday was so bad. That they've blown it, and they've blown it for good, and that's it. They're living in the past, and so nothing in the future will ever be okay. Philippians 3, verse 13 through 14, has a different view. The Apostle Paul writes, Brethren, I do not consider myself to have arrived yet. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are in the past, which are behind and reaching forward to those things which lie ahead of me. I press toward the goal, aiming for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This is not just good advice. This is a warning. He says, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are in the past, forgetting those things, those transgressions, those stupid decisions. How many has made any stupid decisions in the past? Well, come on, yeah. Okay, so we're even going back before this morning. <laughs> so many people are living in the past, and our past can be a hindrance or a help in moving toward God's purposes come on. for each of us. For some, the past has meant pain, it's meant heartache. The danger lies in that we forget our past or we let our past dictate our responses to the future. See, that's the problem with living the past. We get so jaded about our future, we allow the past to map out how we're going to live our lives or how we're going to think about life or how we're going to determine who we are in the future. And if we allow the past to make us a victim, then we have not entered into the grace of God and what he has for us. Yes, amen. Because the grace of God is all about telling our past, you belong back there, you don't belong here. Today is my day. Come on, somebody. Amen. 
Today is a new person. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Amen. That old life, forget that. We buried that. And I gave you a new man. And I gave you a new image. And I gave you a new heart. Amen. I gave you a new future. And a new path. And a new destiny. But you're still living like you're the old you. Mm, come on. You're still thinking because somebody doesn't shake your hand, they don't like you. Because you were so guilty about something you did in the past, and somebody might not have liked you then because of what you did to them. And so you are, you're filled with it. You're filled with it. Come on. Jesus. We allow our past to make us victims. And if we live on memories of past successes it's equally as bad we fail to raise our vision for new things we fail to move ahead and, and create something new today amen hallelujah and praise god we again are victims of our past our prayer must be god anoint me this morning with fresh oil god do a brand new thing in my life god i don't let my past be the dictate of where i am in the future Paul warns us to let go of these things. He says, those things is what he calls it. What are those things? Those things which hinder a person or a church from moving ahead with God. Those things which kill our growth as an individual or as a local body of believers. Those things which keep us going in circles. You ever been running around in circles which keep us tied to the past and by doing so they steal our future. Come on. Paul saying release those things to be dead with the past. Earlier in the chapter, verses 5 through 7, I'm, uh, I'm going to read that quickly. You don't have to turn there. The Apostle Paul tells us what those things were for him because he's talking even about his own life. He lists seven things that he's talking about in verse 5 through 7. Amen. Philippians chapter 3. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm a descendant of Israel. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a pure-blooded Hebrew. When it comes to living up to standards, I was a Pharisee. When it comes to being enthusiastic, I was the persecutor of the church. When it comes to winning God's approval by keeping Jewish laws, I was perfect. And these things that I once considered valuable, I now consider worthless for Christ. What he's saying was he was circumcised the eighth day. He was born into the faith of Judaism, not a proselyte Jew. He was an Israelite. A Roman citizen, but of Jewish race. From the tribe of Benjamin, he came from the tribe of King Saul. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. That means he and his parents were fluent in the Hebrew Aramaic languages. He was a Pharisee from a very strict religious background. Persecuting the church. Zealous for Judaism. Adhered to the law of Moses. No one could fault him in his observance of the laws. Consider this with me if you can. At one time, these things were very important to Paul. These made him who he was. These were like awards and trophies on his mantle. Some of us have some of those. Mine are in a box, all broken up in pieces, I think, somewhere. Of course, they've been in a box for a long time. One of those... One time, the, the, these things were everything. The, Paul was very proud of these things. And these, these were the very things in which he identified himself. This is how Paul measured his success. But when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, everything changed. Church, listen, now Paul counted those things as loss, as waste, as refuse, that he might gain Christ and Christ alone, that he might lose who Paul was so that he can be reborn in who Christ has made him. He wants to be Christ's man, no longer his own man. Now the cry of the heart of Paul was, oh, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable even unto death. 
There's an essential correction that needs to be made this morning. Paul admits he's not arrived, he's not attained, he's not gotten there. He goes, look, I'm not finished, I'm not chief of chiefs. I'm not, I'm not arrived, I mean, I'm not in heaven, I'm not perfect. Right? That's what he's saying. It's not like, I'm not saying I arrived, but let me tell you I'm about my journey. He's not arrived, but he must press ahead. He's saying, I have to lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. He tells his brother, I do not consider myself to have arrived, but this one thing I do. And he's telling us that we too need to do this one thing. And that's an important part of what follows. Paul has taken time to examine his life. When was the last time you totally examined your life? He has reviewed his accomplishments. And for the first time in his life, he rolled his eyes when he was done recounting his trophies. Hallelujah. He's reviewed his accomplishments, his honors, and his crimes against the church. Now he sums up all of his passions, his dreams, his future, and his desires by saying, but this one thing I do. He sums all of his past, everything before salvation. He sums up as one thing. Paul is telling us he now knows what his focus is, what his goal must be, what his number one priority has to be from this point forward. Paul knows, amen, that there are many, thi many things which can hold us back. There's a whole lot of reasons that we've not been successful in the kingdom of God. I know people that are backslidden every three months their entire lives, and there's absolutely reasons for that. Amen. Because there's only one thing that will allow us to break loose from that. There's only one thing that if we truly do it, and do it in the right spirit, and with our whole heart, that we can make that step forward and never return to that person we were before. Yes. Amen. Come on. He says, I know what my goal is. I know what my number one priority is. And that is that I'm going, that I'm going to uh, leave these things behind. I'm going to do this one thing which will allow us to break loose and let God move like a river yeah. through our lives. Amen. And, th and through this church. Hallelujah. We cannot run two races at the same time. Mm. We cannot serve two masters at the same time. On the list of priorities for our lives, only one thing, church, can stand at the top. And it is that one thing which determines how we live here and now. How our life goes from this point forward. And where we will live and ultimately end up there and then. Are you with me? Praise God, it's important that you're with me, amen. Yes, Jesus. It all begins with those things. The one thing is so big, so important, so vital to our spiritual life that this one thing will release us from those things so that we may gain the prize. Yes, Jesus. So this is the one thing. And I've already brought it to bear. This is the one that Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind. Forgetting those things in the past. If I'm going to make it for Christ, I've got to bury Tom. Come on. If I'm going to be who I need to be here, i got to bury the influences that made Tom, Tom. And listen to me. Tom was a mess. One of those things in Paul's list of things which were once important to him, he lists race, his religion, his nationality. Wouldn't it be good if, if, if this country could lay aside race and we could just all be Americans? Yes. Wouldn't it be good if race wasn't an issue because it's not an issue for me? I, I pastored in Black Akron and in Zambia, Central Africa. I think I've dealt with the black issue. Come on. 
I think I love them as much as any other color because I don't see what color they are. I have black men, women, and children that call me dad, call me papa. Yes. Because of our experience in Africa. That love me like they're going to have a picture of me on their wall and tell their grandkids, this is the past, this is my father, the one that adopted me and gave us the life that we have now. And it's not me at all, it's Jesus. It's letting those things behind, right? Yes. So that I can press forward to those things which are ahead. Amen. And so Paul is talking about his, his traditions, his culture, his past glories, his past sins, and this pretty much... Uh, sums up everything that kept him Saul of Tarsus. But he's Paul of Jesus now. Amen. I'm Tom Cunningham of Jesus now. Hallelujah. And you may or may not notice the change, but I promise you every single person you talk to that went to school with me will say, what? He's a what? Yeah, he's a pastor. Well, no, you don't understand. I know Tom. He's no pastor. That was the old Tom Cunningham. I'm Tom Cunningham of Jesus now. I didn't give myself a new name when I got saved. Maybe I should have, but the glory of God is my life. And he is saying that those things are the things that Paul accomplished and that Paul achieved but to achieve in the Lord, we have to lay down our accomplishments and our view of success and let Christ completely remake us this morning. Amen. You need to be remade. You can't just say, well, I need to change some things. No, you need to bury yourself. You need to be buried. You need to raise again in the resurrection of Christ and be a brand new person. I, 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 yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to get a hold of something. I'm trying to change something. No, no, no. Bury that guy. Yeah, come on. Or you'll never make it. Come on, somebody. Yes. And so many people, they don't understand that. But what happens is they change a few things. They start feeling good about themselves, right? They start doing they get a job. When they came to Christ, they didn't know how to use deodorant. Now they have a job. It's like a big deal. And they, and they start feeling pretty good about themselves. All kinds of good things are happening. And then what happens? They feel comfortable and confident enough about themselves that the old life can live comfortably within it now. And so you begin to invite back some of the old you. Because, well, I'm not going to become what I was before. And I'm not, that was insane. But as you were becoming it, you didn't think it was insane. You only think it's insane because you're saved and you look back at what you became. And what you're inviting back into your life because you're not remade is just as insane. Are you hearing it? Should I be clearer? Should I preach without use of metaphor? Because <laughs> I can do that. It's fine. I can say things like stop being a psycho uh -huh. and get a hold of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, a brand new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When somebody dies, what do we say? We say they've passed away. Old things have passed away. Yes. And all things become new. Paul is saying, I refuse to let those things keep me chained to the past. Among other qualities, Paul had the equivalent of at least three advanced university degrees. No matter how notable those accomplishments might be to the world, they are but dung. Dung is another word for doo-doo. <laughs> to Christ. And what he can do through you is so much greater than that. And I'm letting those things go. And I'm leaving those things behind wow. so that Christ can make a new Tom Cunningham. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Blind Bartimaeus cast off his robe in Mark chapter 10. Before coming to Jesus. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called and 
They called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good comfort, rise, he's calling you. And Bartimaeus, or and he, casting away his garment, uh -huh. rose up, stood up, and came to Jesus. Now why would he cast off his robe? Because it was a tattered piece of miserable cloth. Filthy, smelly, messy. And Bartimaeus understood something. He refused to be identified with the robe of a beggar any longer. The clothing and lifestyle of a blind man. That's done. That's over. He was forgetting those things which were behind. He knew that when he went to Jesus, amen, that he would no longer be blind. He would no longer be a yeah. beggar. He would be put on a robe of righteousness. Yeah. Amen. To replace the robe of a beggar. Yes, Lord. Come on. Why are so many people in church still wearing the robe of a beggar? Oh, come on. Still wearing the robe of the world. When you've got so much that Christ wants to give you. Blind Bartimaeus is no longer blind Bartimaeus. We call him Bart now. And he's got a new robe of righteousness. Amen. He's forgetting those things which are behind. And ten minutes later, he's smart. Somebody comes, weren't you the blind man? He said, oh, that's so long ago. That's not so not me. Paul was all too aware of the examples from Jewish history and from Jesus' ministry to those who refused to forget those things behind and who now speaks of failure. The Israelites coming out of Egypt, they could not forget those things and they could not leave them behind. Thus, they died in the wilderness. Are you hearing me? Yes. They died in the wilderness. Amen. The rich young ruler and his riches lacked one thing. And he could not leave those material things behind and follow Christ. And he's never heard from again. The Pharisees in their religion, they could not leave their religious traditions behind. And could not rec recognize the Messiah in their very midst. And they missed out on the moment in history that they've been waiting for for hundreds and thousands of years. See, we need to be aware of modern day examples as well. There are dying denominations who could not leave behind archaic methods of sharing the gospel, would not let the Spirit do a new thing. Are you hearing me? You hearing me? Dead, dry Christians who cannot leave personal preferences uh, to experience a new move of God. Stubborn disciples who refuse to really listen, forgetting those attitudes and accomplishments of the past long enough to be discipled and become something brand new. See, God's promise was... And this is a prophecy to this church and to your life. And it's actually the prophecy for us for this year as our theme. Isaiah 43, 19. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not recognize it? Do you not perceive what I'm doing in your midst, saith God? I am making a way in the desert. I'm making streams in the wasteland. I am taking your life and I am making it fruitful. And I am empowering it. And I am bringing it to life. See, our past should only be viewed for what we can learn from. Amen. We must, church, move forward. We must avoid viewing the negative or the positive for more than what we can learn from it. So grab a hold of whatever mistakes were made in the past and maybe take a few tidbits of truth out of those and then bury the rest like a carcass in the desert. Come on. <clears throat> and take a few tidbits to your future and learn from them. Many have allowed their past to dictate their future. God is always about doing new things in our lives. He gives fresh revelation of his purposes for us, for you and I. Tomorrow should be a revelation given by God as a gift to you. Do not live in the past. Do not hold on to bitterness that may hinder God from doing new and exciting things in your life today. 
tomorrow. Because he can turn our wastelands. And I don't know about you, but I had some wastelands. God can turn our wastelands into streams of water to give life. Amen. Not death. And he can turn that desert into a garden blossoming with a new you. How you viewed your past? Has your past hindered you in your way of thinking? See, some of you just flat out need to change the way you think. Think like Christ. Quit trying to think like that. Super slick dude you used to be. Ah, uh, come on. <laughs> Let me change that. Super slick dude you thought you were. <laughs> That's a whole other sermon. We'll go there some other time. Put aside such thoughts and allow God to do a new thing in your life. Ask him to help you yes. to see new things that he wants to do. Yes, so that you can anticipate them and be ready for them and step into them. Amen. Uh, through you today and tomorrow. I think of, uh, of the example of college basketball legend John Wooden, who after retiring from his coaching career, wrote a number of books on life and leadership. What's amazing to me is that Coach Wooden, who passed away in 2010, just four months shy of his 100th birthday, wrote his two best-selling books between his late 80s and his mid-90s. His best-selling books were written at the very end I was like, because he refused to allow that neural imaging to recount all the past. Yeah. My father passed away of Lewy body dementia, which is much like Alzheimer's, in, in that you lose your memory. And at the end of his life, I would, before he became completely uh, catatonic and not able to communicate, he was uh, sitting in the nursing home and I would sit next to him. I went and visited him every single day, uh, pretty much. And I would sit next to him, and he would recount stories he never told us growing up, things that happened in his life. He could remember his eighth, his eighth year in life, eight year old, better than he can remember that morning's breakfast. But he lived, he was smiling and laughing and recounting and talking. He would go in and out of, uh, uh, of lucidity. But I can remember looking at the look on his face when he recounted a memory that was so fresh to him. It's like it just happened. He'd smile. He would brighten up. You, you got to hear this. And sometimes you get my name wrong. But you got to hear this. And he'd tell that story. And I thought, you know what's sad about this? Is that he's living his joy. Pioneer. I do work for God. So many people said, 
You're 50. You've got no money, no savings, no retirement. And you're leaving a church to come and start over? Yeah. And you know what? It's the greatest move I ever made. It's amazing. It's a move that matters. And I don't know about you, but I want my life above all to matter. That's what I want my life to be. And my life couldn't matter if the old Tom Cunningham keeps resurrecting himself. He's a selfish bear. Or that. Amen. But the new Tom Cunningham, he can matter. He can make a difference. And God has a revival relevant for your future. He has saved the best wine for last. Don't forget that. He has got a revival relevant for you. God has a fresh anointing prepared for every single person in this congregation and every congregation and every church that is willing to move beyond those things and let God lead them into a land of promise. Reach forth this morning to those new things which lie ahead. Let go and let God do a new thing in you this morning. Let go of those things that made you who you were before and let Jesus remake you now, this morning right here, so that you can take your life from this point forward and become something amazing and matter to those around you. There's one thing I do. Forget those things which are behind and press toward the prize, the mark of the high cost. That message was reminded to me through other areas of media no less than five times that this is what I need to preach this morning. So God is helping some people present right here, right now, and on live stream, as well as in real life, in person church as they call it now all the new phrases popping up because of COVID but here we are this morning we're in the house of God whether or not you thought that was going to be possible for you, here you are whether or not you thought you'd ever get another chance here you are the question is what are you going to do with it the same thing you did with your other chances? Like dust blowing in the wind? Or are you going to do something Christ-like with his chance? Are you going to let him remake you into a brand new you? If you're not saved, you're not born again, you're not right with God, listen to me. Jesus loves you. He died for you. He paid for your life on the cross of Calvary. That gives you eternity. It gives you peace and happiness. It surpasses understanding. It gives you transcendent nature. It gives you a, a, a miraculous point of view. It gives you a new life, a new health. By his stripes we are healed. It gives you all manner of things. And you know what he gets out of this? Just you. That's why he died so he could have just you in eternity with him forever. That's a precious, powerful thing. If you're not saved, if you're not born again, you are missing out on the greatest deal you could ever possibly get, especially in these last days. If you can't tell these are the last days, you are not paying attention. God is offering you. Jesus is knocking at your door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. And he's knocking on your heart's door. And he's offering you the deal of a lifetime. Where the old you can be buried and the new you can start over. Take the deal. Give your life to Jesus. And if that's you this morning, and you 
are hearing what I'm saying and you need to make that change, that transition, that decision. You lift your hand quickly so I can see it. You want to give your life to Jesus. God sees that hand. How many others? You give your life to Jesus Christ. You want to have a brand new heart. Maybe you're backslidden away from God. You were saved, but you're not living for God now. Or you've never prayed this prayer, but you just assumed you're saved because you go to church. That is a <laughs> sad mistake. You have to make a decision to live for Jesus publicly before men. The scripture says. Join this honest heart. Anybody at all, you want to give your life to Jesus, you lift up your hand. You're not slipping away from God. You want to get your heart right. You lift up your hand. Praise God. Son, I'm going to have you come up in just a moment. Just stay where you are right now. Church, we have got, we've got to bury the old man if we're going to have the future we want and desire. We've got to allow Christ. We've got to do this. We've got to do, are you listening to me? Everybody listening to me? We've got to do this. We've got to forget those things which are behind. you got to lay down that past. Quit carrying it around like a ball and chain. Quit breaking your neck trying to keep up with what happened before. Let today be a brand new place for you to start. This altar is open. You come and find a place to pray. We're going to turn off the live stream. Amen. We're going to turn off the live stream so that people at the altar can have privacy. Get that for me.